Now, to continue this, when we look at transportation, we can separate that from geography because transportation of things through space entails geography. And in the age of e-commerce, where apparently you only have to click someplace on a computer and then stuff is brought to you as a, by magic, nonetheless, transportation is, is crucial. Um, if you've ever been stuck at a railroad crossing in downtown Fresno, uh, when there was a long train passing with double stack shipping containers, um, you'll see that in action. This is the movement of, of goods through space. And most of that, even now that the whole trade war is going on, most of that comes from the ports of Oakland and Los Angeles um, and from China, ultimately. So I think I'm going to take this full screen because that will allow you the better to see, well, it won't let me do that. Why not? I wanna show you the whole picture when we get to the maps. Um, mm -hmm. Where is Ding? Let's try this. Oh, well, here goes. So, one of the most important forces to shape geography is water. Um, it carves valleys, it makes rivers, and these are places where people can get from A to B quickly. Remember when I talked about the world before Columbus, but even after the Atlantic economy, oceans connect people. Likewise, because water transportation is so much faster than land transportation before you get decent roads and railroads and so far, um, river transportation is the next best thing because there again on water, you can go from A to B pretty quickly. In fact, you don't even need propulsion on rivers like the Mississippi. People will just tie together a couple of logs to make a raft, put it on the river, and if they happen to be going towards the sea, it'll take them there more or less automatically and by default. The problem really arises when you are not traveling where the rivers go, but if you want to go someplace else. Now, if you recall the the Whiskey Rebellion and Shays Rebellion, and where these took place. These were precisely in locations separated from the commercial centers by mountains, where the rivers that ran there went someplace else uh, from the, uh, not to the commercial centers. So if you really want to create a nationwide uh, network of transportation, you're going to have to somehow work around that. Um, let's focus on the Northeast. I want to point out to you here, these red lines on the map. These are what are called divides in American English or watersheds in British English. Um, consider the one that runs straight down the center. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse cursor here, where you have where it says the James River. And then here to the left of that, you have a red line running north to south. That is the divide between the James River on the right, on the east, and the Ohio River on the west, on the left. If you were standing right on that red line um, in the real world, and you had a bottle of water, and you dumped it out west of it, all that water would flow into the Ohio eventually and through the Ohio into the Gulf of Mexico. If you dumped out that same bottle of water on the other side of the line, it would eventually run into the James River and out into the Atlantic. And that's the meaning of a watershed. So everything on the right, on the east of this line, which is the, the crest of the Appalachians, runs into the Atlantic straight through some of these rivers. 
Everything north of this is the basin of the Great Lakes that empties through the St. Lawrence on the border of Canada and eventually through Canada. And then the, the whole middle of the country drains down the Mississippi. And then eventually you get to the, um, to the west coast. Let's go to the big map again. You have one big watershed here where the Colorado River flows into the um, Gulf of California. And then everything to the west through various rivers, much of it through the American River and the Bay of San Francisco into the Pacific. But the whole middle of the country, far more than half the country drains into the Gulf of Mexico and most of that again through the Mississippi. And the Mississippi runs north-south, whereas on the East Coast, you're really looking for ways of getting things from east, uh, from west to east. This is where Chicago is located. That is where all the railroad lines come together from the grain fields of the Midwest. And then you have Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore on the Eastern seaboard. And that's where these goods want to go. That's where the merchants said to have the capital. Um, now, if you overlay the map I previously used with elevations where the the green is the lowland and the brown is the, um, is the mountains. So you can see that pretty clearly. How you have these cells, so to speak, where the natural geography suggests that you're going to be taking transportation in a particular direction. Um, so highlighted here with the green arrows, this is where the water flows. And, and that is where transportation is easy. Anything you're going to try and take someplace else from there, not so easy. By the way, the red blocks here, that indicates that you can't ship down that way. There is rapids north of Detroit, and then there is the uh, Niagara Falls right here. Um, so you, you can go down Niagara Falls, but just once. Um, and then in blue here are the big commercial centers of the East Coast that I just mentioned, whereas in red, you have the new up and coming cities of the Midwest. This is where all the goods from that Midwest come together. Um, naturally, they would trade with the rest of the world down the Mississippi River, down the Ohio and Mississippi. So one way of addressing this is building roads. And the national road was the attempt by the federal government um, starting in the early 1800s to connect east and west across the Appalachian Mountains with a, with a decent paved road that could get people over these mountains quickly. It starts in Cumberland and that is on the Potomac River, upriver from Washington DC. Um, so it actually, ends up taking you to the nation's capital. From Cumberland to Washington, you have a canal that you can take, um, but for, for the rest of the way, you have a road. Um, the, <clears throat> the types of teams of oxen or horses that took the carts on that road is shown in this diorama here. Um, and this is a, a tremendous improvement. You might want to go back to the lecture <coughs> about the Whiskey Rebellion, how hard it was to get things from, say, Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, shown on these maps in this lecture too. Um, this makes a huge difference. It, it cuts the transportation cost to a fraction. Um, <coughs> for passenger transportation as well, here shown is a stagecoach. The engineering of this national road was so good that in some places in Ohio, it is still visible today. This is 200 year old pavement, um, obviously no longer in use. If you use it with modern cars, it would be ground to dust pretty quickly, but um, it was built for the ages. The bridges on the other hand, those are in fact still in use. Um, and the route of the national road matches more or less I-70, I think, Interstate 70. So if you superimpose in blue the national road on that map I, I showed you earlier, what you see here is that in fact, yes, it does uh, bridge the red line, that watershed 
the divide. Um, and where before you could only travel quickly and cheaply where the green light lines here run, now you can actually go from St. Louis on the Mississippi River where the Missouri and Mississippi flow together all the way to Washington within a few days and take heavy things along to market. Um, for, well, further simplified here, you see how this national road not just does that, but it also connects, in fact, minor river systems throughout the Midwest. Um, it crosses the Wabash, for instance, here, which is an important one, um, before it gets you to the eastern seaboard. Now, this is before 1820. And then once Andrew Jackson becomes president, he shuts down the program of road building. He decides this is not a job for the federal government, so he vetoes the Maysville Road extension, and that kind of kills, up until the 1950s, under Eisenhower, any federal involvement with road building, interestingly enough. Um, and because the federal government is now opting out of transportation networks, the states step in. And the first state to, to carry that burden is the state of New York, whose governor um, promotes the Erie Canal, which runs from Albany on the Hudson River, all the way across to Buffalo on Lake Erie, which significantly is not on Lake Ontario. Because remember this year where it says Lockport, that's when Niagara Falls is. So you want to be upriver from the falls. And that way you can avoid having to deal with them. What that means is that now all the way from Detroit, or if you add this canal to the picture, which is built later, but when the Erie Canal is opened, you can take a boat from Detroit to New York without having to use land transportation once. And um, while the national road is nice, water-based transportation is that much more cheap. It's not necessarily faster, but you don't have to feed uh, the oxen. Even in the places where you have to have horses to draw the boats, horses that run a along a path on the side of the canal to draw the boats, um, you don't need as much animal power for traction than if you are traveling on a road. So here in a close up of the Erie Canal, the Hudson River is actually technically an ocean inlet all the way up to Albany. Don't ask me why. Uh, I'm not a geologist or whatever, a geographer. But that means it's, it's deep, there are no rapids, there are no waterfalls, so you can take a boat comfortably to Albany. Um, and then from there, the canal using, in some cases, valleys that were existing already because you had little streams and rivers there, and it goes all the way to Buffalo right here. Um, crucial for building canals is the lock. A lock is a basin of water that helps a ship surmount vertical distance, a uh, height differential. It is closed by these V-shaped gates at the end, that point, the, the, the tip of the V points upriver, so towards the, where the water is coming from, um, and they can be opened, and when they're opened, then the water flows into or out of this basin. How does that work exactly? If you look at it here on the top, you have an 1820s style packet boat that on the left enters the lock, then the gate at the far end is closed, water from the top is allowed to flow into the basin, uh, taking the boat up as it fills up the basin, and then the top lock, the one that's closer to us, uh, door is opened, and then the, the boat can travel on on the high end of the canal. See on the bottom here, you see that also how that works. And of course, it's easy. You can just open the, uh, you can just open a valve here in the gate, the water can flow in. And if you're going downriver, um, it's simply reversed. 
this is what this might look like in, in real life. The waterfall is where water that is not needed to operate the lock is allowed to pass by the lock. Um, and it looks, because it's with the zoom lens, it looks like the, the boat might fall off the waterfall, but it doesn't. It's headed uh, on the other end of these buoys here. It is headed for the lock. Um, here's another very nice illustration of how this works. Lockport near Buffalo, um, where the canal takes a turn to avoid the Niagara Falls. On the right-hand side, the five-step lock, narrower for boats of the sort that were used in the 1820s. On the left-hand side, a two-step lock, used for larger barges that you would have seen in the 1870s. So they expanded the lock and the, the city of Lockport. Um, that suggests that this place was built at the locks. The canal came first, the industrial transportation infrastructure came first, the city was built around it. Just like the coaling stations um, of the railroad that became towns, That's just like the rail junctions and termini that became towns. The canals too um, created their own urbanization to go with the technology or the support infrastructure. So here in white, the Erie Canal superimposed on that map we used earlier. And by the way, here, the gap in the red line is where you actually have a natural gap in the mountain. So that's why you can build that canal there. You can't build it and you couldn't have built it anywhere else, not as easy. That doesn't, that, oh, sorry, that doesn't prevent other states from trying, like the um, Pennsylvania, if you can see here, it says Allegheny Portage. That is literally a portage railroad is um, rails where you have a wench to pull boats up all the way the incline to the top of the mountain and then back down again the other side, um, which is pretty awkward. But the mountains are, there are too many of them and they're too high to blast them away to build a canal through them. Even with locks, you can't surmount that kind of height differential. It gets worse the further to the south you get. So in Pennsylvania, you can try, you can work with the Portage Railroad. Once you get to Maryland and Virginia down here, until the railroad comes onto the scene, there really isn't all that much you can do. And this is where the national road runs down. So railroads are the next step. In 1825, the Erie Canal um, happens. In, in the same year, the first workable steam locomotives are tried out in England. And because in Maryland and Virginia, there is a desperate wish to, to match New York for having easy access to the markets of the West, merchants in Baltimore jump on that completely unproven, newfangled invention and start the first railroad company, the Baltimore and Ohio, in 1829. And they start building shortly afterwards um, to connect Baltimore to the Ohio. Now, when you see these maps in history books, this one from 1861, it's tempting to look at it as a national network. But if you break it down, <clears throat> first of all, if you even in 1861, this is the year the Civil War came, it is not a network. These are all short lines owned by different companies, in many cases that don't work together, that will actively work against each other. And that in some cases use different gauges, meaning that the distance between the rails um, is not standardized. So you can't just run a train down one line and then onto another because it would fall off the rails. The, the, the wheels wouldn't match where the rails are. So this is not a network. It, um, it can be made to look like one if you put it on a map like this, but in reality it is. The technology of the railroad too is developing. When the Baltimore and Ohio ran their first train just to the first station out of the city of Baltimore, um, this is what it looked like. You have that same kind of tea kettle looking boiler, steam boiler on the locomotive that drives a single piston uh, that then drives the, the train. 
and the cars are evidently um, horse-drawn coaches put on a bogey uh, to, to place on the tracks with wheels. By the 1850s, and this again is from the Baltimore and Ohio, when they start crossing the mountains, they need much more powerful engines. And this is one example. You see the four axles, um, small driving wheels, which means that more of the power is going to be used on traction and less on speed. The bigger the driving wheels, the more you're, you're trading traction uh, off in, in order to gain speed. So this is going to be a, a slow locomotive, but a powerful one that can draw heavy loads or and or can go up steep hills without losing much speed. Um, but it kind of looks with the development of the technology like they're still trying to figure out what goes where. Um, so the Baltimore and Ohio starts in hmm, oh, 1828, actually. It builds its first, its first line in 1830, but that doesn't reach the Ohio River all the way at the end of the line until 1853. By that time, Baltimore has lost the competition with New York to be the main trading center for the United States. Um, and the reason it took so long <clears throat> it's because Baltimore didn't have as much capital to back their railroad as New York did for the Erie Canal. And because of that advantage that comes with having the Erie Canal, New York just uh, pushes Baltimore back further. So the, the paucity of capital that they had at first doesn't, only gets worse. And yet, when this railroad was completed in 1853, it was a boon to the city. It was definitely an eco economically um, boosting effect. In the middle between New York and Baltimore, Philadelphia also is promoting its own rail connection to the West, the merchants of Philadelphia, and that is the Pennsylvania Railroad. Within the map of Pennsylvania here, you see that this railroad too is mainly going to Pittsburgh where it hits the Ohio. and um, the point is likewise to tap into the markets in the, in the West. And then finally, New York gets its own railroad, the New York and Erie, um, because it turns out that the canal freezes over in the winter. So if you don't want to fall back in the winter time, if you want a connection that is more or less all year and all weather, you also have to go uh, down the railroad. Uh, path. So that's what they're doing. But all of that taken together, see here the, um, the black lines on the map, that's the railroads existing in 1840. You can see that on a smaller scale, all these different railroads are started to overcome local disadvantages of geography. Um, to bypass Rapid, river, rapid, river rapids to, um, to connect two different river systems, to take transportation a little further beyond a port on the river or on a lake. Um, so all of these are locally financed. They serve the narrow business interests of local merchant groups. Um, and just because you get more of these lines doesn't mean that you get something qualitatively different. Now in the 1850 picture here, you see how the tendrils are, are kind of reaching further. You have the Baltimore and Ohio all the way to Cumberland. You have the one from Philadelphia all the way to, uh, almost all the way to Pittsburgh. But they're both, they ha both haven't managed to get it across the mountains yet. In fact, only in New York, do you have a rail line that now does go across the mountains and one that runs parallel to the Erie Canal. So the initial advantage that this transportation that this transportation innovation brought to New York uh, keeps paying off um, for that. So th then by 1860, when on the first map I showed you, it looked like you have a nationwide network. What you see is that here over the mountains, you have a couple of places where that connection has been made. And then 
everything that exists here in the Midwest is more or less feeder lines that, um, that serve the purpose of bringing business to these east-west railroads. And again, in many cases, these groups, these are competing groups of business interests. So in the Civil War, this turns out to be virtually useless and the United States has to, uh, the military has to take over and run these railroads in order to be able to use them um, in the war effort. Now, in spite of all that, there is a sense that the railroad is really a game changer, but I'm gonna take another break here for a third part.